Today and next week, we're going to look at a story that rivals any award-winning movie. It's got all the elements, tragedy, a comeback, a hero, and a completely unexpected tear-jerking ending. We're only going to spend two weeks, but I encourage you, if you haven't already been, to read and study the book of Ruth. Chapter 1, verse 1, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. It was a tense, difficult time in Israel. Judges 21, 25 tells us that everyone did as he saw fit. In other words, there was no central authority or law. Not only that, there was a famine. We don't really know why. There may have been a lack of rain. There may have been diseased crops. Maybe insects destroyed the harvest. A famine was often evidence of God's discipline against his people who had sinned against him. Regardless of the reason, food was hard to find. Israel was in economic, political, and social chaos. A man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, and they went to Moab and lived there. Elimelech decided staying in Bethlehem was too difficult for his family, and so he moved them to Moab. With that background, that doesn't seem like a horrible decision, but Moab was Israel's bitter enemy. Rather than turn to God and trust him to provide, Elimelech and his family abandoned God's people and God's land to live with the enemy. This is like a, an Arkansas Razorback fan deciding to root for Alabama. Or, or for that matter, San Jose State. <laughs> Too soon? This was like an American moving to Iran to help their military. Elimelech went to the enemy for help. Bad decision. Things only got worse there. Elimelech died. Now Naomi was left with her two sons who had both married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. After 10 years, both of the sons also died, which left Naomi in a desperate situation. In their culture, if a woman's husband died, her son stepped in to support her. Now with her husband dead and her son's dad, Naomi had no way to support herself. She couldn't start a business or get a job. Her options were limited. She could sell herself into slavery, she could become a prostitute, or she could slowly die. The first lesson we learn from Naomi is, when you're in trouble, don't run to the enemy. I see it so often. People face trouble, hardship, grief, or loss, and instead of connecting deeper to God and church, they run to Moab. They run to the enemy. In an attempt to escape their situation, they turn to bars and clubs, drugs and alcohol. They have affairs. They enter into relationships that can't and won't have God's blessing. They run to the most amazing people and places. And from the outside looking in, you want to yell, don't do it. Don't run from God. Run to God. You try to intervene, but people run past all the warning signs. They ignore common sense, and then they experience the consequences. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, so Naomi went to Moab. She experienced heartache and tragedy. Meanwhile, back home where she should have stayed, the Lord had provided for his people. Leaving God's land and God's protection was such a bad decision. Now Naomi made a wise decision. Naomi and her daughter-in-law prepared to return home from there. You've heard it from me countless times, but I will never stop saying it. We're serious I mean it. Look at me. You can always come home. Amen. Always. No matter how far you run, God will welcome you back. We will welcome you back. We can't erase the consequences of running, but we can love you, cry with you, hug you, pray with you, and believe God's best for you. If disobedience to God and his plan has landed you in trouble, the way back is clear. Return to the point of disobedience and obey. Do what you should have done the first time. Obedience is the pathway to blessing. Earlier, earlier this year, I was in Madrid uh, working with Project Rescue. 
Pastor Parker was with me, and one night uh, we headed out to the district where women are trafficked. It's a sad, evil, horrible place. We had a big group. We had people from Africa there with us that we were hosting, so we had to split up in several cars. Parker and I arranged the group strategically, and then we put ourselves with the least knowledgeable drivers because we wanted our guests to have the best experience. My driver was driving a rental car, a stick shift. I'm not sure exactly, but I think it was her first time to ever drive a stick. <laughs> From the hotel, she put it in gear, popped the clutch, wham, a head slammed back against the seat. We did that all night long. Try to turn in somewhere and we'd lurch and stop in the middle of the road. I, I tried not to laugh. I wanted to encourage her, but it was kind of hard because she, she didn't understand English, and I don't speak very good Spanish. Her husband was driving the car Parker was in. We followed really, really close. <laughs> and as we got closer to the district, I realized she'd never been there. I was riding it in a new car with a new driver in an unfamiliar area, that's controlled by organized crime and filled with questionable characters. But really, that was okay. I wasn't nervous about that because I've been there before. We drove through the area. We stopped and we talked with the women. Everything was going great until we entered a roundabout. Everybody know what a roundabout is? If you've been to Conway, they've built them to confuse you there, right? As we were approaching the roundabout, the car Parker was in got in, but then a car got between us and Parker's car. We got in the roundabout. I saw the car Parker was in go left, and I said, go left, which apparently means absolutely nothing in Spanish because she didn't understand. We missed the turn. And so she started around the roundabout again. I pointed. We missed the turn again. And at that point, she panicked. I was pointing and saying, go there, but she wasn't listening. We just kept going around and around that roundabout. And each time around, we would go faster until finally I'm hanging on to that strap and we are flying around that roundabout. It, she got on the phone with her husband while we're speeding around the roundabout. She's yelling at him and speeding up. We flew around it seven, eight, nine times. Finally, I just yelled, stop, and pointed to the side of the road. She pulled off. She was breathing hard. She was yelling at her husband. She was sweating bullets. She was terrified. I was trying not to laugh. <laughs> I called Parker to find out where they were, and he said, Dad, just turn on the hazard lights so we can see you, and then start driving. We'll find you. She followed my pointed directions. No luck. We couldn't find them. So finally, I made her pull over, called Parker, and he said, Dad, drop a pin on Google Maps and send it to me. And when we figure out where we, you are, we'll come to you. When they found us, it was quite an interesting reunion. They were talking in Spanish way too fast for me to comprehend. I think it was a joyful moment. <laughs> you know, when you're lost, you pull out your phone, and the first thing you want to know is, where am I? It's comforting to see that little you are here sign pop up on the map. All of a sudden, there's hope because Google Maps knows where you are. And if it knows where you are, it can direct you to where you need to be. Sometimes when you've wandered off course in life, you just want to know where you are. You need to see that you are here sign pop up on the map. And I want you to know, not only does Jesus know where you are, he's right there with you. You may have got to that point by yourself. You may be there as a result of someone else's bad choices. But the fact remains, Jesus knows. And he's with you, ready to lead you home. I put some stickers in your bulletin today that I just want you to use as, as reminders. Put them somewhere where you'll see it every once in a while to remind you Jesus knows. Naomi headed home but gave her daughters-in-law the option to stay in Moab. It's an emotional, tender part of the story. 
Naomi recognized there's no hope for her, but Orpah and Ruth were young and might find another husband to care for them. Orpah stayed in Moab, but Ruth made a difficult decision. Uh, her reply to Naomi's instruction to stay in Moab is one of the most famous speeches in the entire Bible. Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Wow, what a powerful, encouraging statement to a mother-in-law who had lost it all. Now remember, Ruth wasn't an Israelite. She was a Moabite. And the Israelites hated Moabites. She served Shemas and other Moabite gods. And so she said, I will go with you to a foreign land. I will adopt your land as mine, and I will leave my God and follow your God. This was not a spur of the moment or a short-term commitment. I've thought about it. I'm in for life. When you make the decision to return to God, he will put people in your life to encourage and walk with you. Accept their help. Be thankful that God put them there. See, your walk back to God doesn't have to be lonely. Remember, everything's better in teams. We are designed by God for relationship with each other and with him. Still, many times, people making their way back to God are embarrassed and ashamed. They fear how people will react, what they will say. Don't isolate yourself. True followers of Jesus will love and celebrate with you. I grew up in church, but through my teen years and in my 20s, I was running from God. I was far from God. I got into alcoholism, and I was drinking all the time and partying all the time and not living like I knew I should be living. Then I met my wife, and we got married and had some kids, and she wanted the kids to be raised in church, and I agreed to keep her happy. I came to church all the time. Things were bad. I was still drinking. Um, I knew, I knew that I needed to make a change, and I could feel the weight of the world just crushing me. Immediately, I knew I had to do something. So I emailed Pastor Rod, and with the subject title, I Need Saved, and my phone rang within five minutes. He called me. He prayed with me. I prayed with him. We cried. I, I was bawling at work, giving my life to the Lord, and I was saved. Pastor Rod connected me with another pastor that was on our staff at the time. His name was Pastor John Long. He just kind of, he pulled me under his wing and talked to me like a human being, like a friend, and made himself available. And he really, really helped me through the struggle of staying sober and being the husband and the father that I knew I needed to be according to God. I can't imagine what my life would be like without these men of God who surrounded me and poured into my life and helped me along this journey. If you're away from the Lord and trying to find your way back, you don't have to walk alone. You'll discover what David discovered. There are people who will walk with you. I'll never forget that phone call. He was crying, I was crying, and celebrating the loving redemption of Jesus. Verse 19, the two women went on till they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. Bethlehem was a small town, no more than a thousand people. Everyone knew each other. Most of them were related. It was like Arkansas. <laughs> there was excitement and commotion because Naomi had come home. Everyone was talking, and the women explained, can this be Naomi? When Naomi heard that, she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. This is, this is just honest, raw emotion and reflection on Naomi's part. She went away full, 
with a husband and two sons. She came back with no one to take care of her and her Moabite daughter-in-law that everyone hated. Sadly, she blamed God for her situation instead of taking responsibility for her own mistakes. I watch people do the same thing. They blame God or other people for their sin. That's a trap. This is an important lesson on your way back to God. Be honest and realistic about your situation. Confess your sin. Repent. Admit your path was wrong. You will never go back the right way until you're first willing to admit that you've been headed the wrong way. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, who everybody hated. Her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And they left in a famine. They returned at harvest time. No more famine. Now, I know you've already read the rest of the story. But I want to take a few minutes and just kind of tell it and maybe point out a few things. Ruth and Naomi had no job, no food. So Ruth went out in the fields to glean, to pick up leftover grain that was left by the harvesters. The law declared that landowners weren't allowed to harvest in the harder to reach corners of their fields, but instead they had to leave those little areas for the poor and for foreigners. That was their welfare system of the day. And just so happened, Ruth ended up in a field belonging to Boaz, a relative of Naomi's former husband. Boaz went by the fields to check on the harvest and saw someone new there. He noticed Ruth, a new woman in the field. He asked one of the workers who she was. The foreman replied, she is a Moabitess. We see the, the prejudice again, who came from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field. She's worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Boaz went and he talked to Ruth and he told her not to work in any other fields, that it was dangerous for a woman to be there alone, especially a Moabitess. He then told his men to leave Ruth alone. She was not to be ridiculed or harassed in any way. Boaz also instructed his workers to give Ruth water when she needed it. Boaz went above and beyond to show unkind, uncommon kindness to a homeless immigrant. At lunchtime, Boaz invited Ruth to eat with him. Again, uncommon kindness. It was unheard of for a landowner to share his field with a Moabite. And at this point in the story, we start to get the idea that maybe Boaz was falling for Ruth. Boaz went a step further. He told his workers to purposely leave full stalks of grain for Ruth to pick up. Ruth gathered enough grain for she and Naomi to eat till they were full and to have leftover. And when Ruth got home, she told Naomi she'd worked in Boaz's field. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Now, this is a key part of the story that's often difficult to understand, and this is going to require a little explanation. At that time in their culture, families passed down their wealth, their land, their possessions from male to male heir. A wife or daughter could not receive inheritance. If a man died without a son or another male heir, the possessions and land were lost from his family. In that case, the closest living relative would assume all the costs of providing for the widow and her family. For a temporary time, he would also own the land. The woman needed someone to take care of her. For now, it would be this man, the kinsman redeemer, but she needed a son to take care of her in the future, and so the family could keep all the possessions. So to provide for her future, the kinsman redeemer took her as a wife and slept with her until she had a son. He would then raise the boy as his own, and eventually, when the boy was old enough, all the land and all the money and all the possessions would go to the son. The kinsman redeemer got nothing out of the deal. It was expensive, and time-consuming to care for relatives. The word redeem means to set free by paying a price. In the case of Ruth and Naomi, 
Elimelech's property had either been sold or it was under some kind of mortgage. The rights to the land had passed to Naomi's son. Follow the lines here. Naomi's son was Ruth's husband. When Elimelech died, Ruth's husband, Naomi's son, got the land and stuff. That explains why we got Ruth and Naomi both there. And Naomi had an idea that Boaz might be their salvation, their kinsman redeemer, who would redeem the land and provide for them. Boaz continued to leave grain in the fields for Ruth and for Naomi. But Naomi got tired of waiting. They needed a long-term plan. So she instructed Ruth to dress up, put on her best perfume, offer herself to Boaz. Ruth followed her mother-in-law's instructions. But Boaz refused the invitation because there was another potential kinsman redeemer who was actually a closer relative. He was first in line. So the obligation was first his. We pick up the story in chapter 4. Meanwhile, Boaz went to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he'd mentioned, the guy who was first in line, came along, Boaz said, come over here, sit down. So he went and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town, said, sit here. They did. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, the guy ahead of him in line, Naomi, who's come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring this manner to your attention and suggest that you buy it. In the presence of these seated here, in the presence of the elders, if you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I'll know. For no one has the right to do it but you. I'm, I'm just next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Boaz reminded the guy, it's not just the land and the stuff. You also get Naomi and Ruth to provide for. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I can't redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I can't do it. He said, I want the land. I want the stuff, but I don't want the extra family members. That, they're good. It's going to take too much money to provide for them. And if, they, if they're part of the deal, I'm out. Now, before you're too hard on this guy, stop and think, because you say the same kind of things. Man, I love that Corvette. But if it comes with my in-laws in the back seat, <laughs> I'll pass. Oh, I, I'd love to live in that house, but with my nephew, no way. I want to marry her, but, but she already has kids. A free trip to Disney? I'm in. With the whole family? I'm out. I want the pay, but not the work. I want the visibility, but not the preparation. I want financial blessings, but I don't want to tithe. I want heaven, but I don't want to obey. I want Jesus, but I don't want to go to church. I want blessing without responsibility and the reward without the price. The guy who was supposed to provide for Ruth and Naomi said, it's going to cost too much money. It might be my right, even my responsibility, but I can't do it. You do it. Boaz didn't care how much it cost. His love for Ruth was so great that he would pay any price to redeem her. And in the presence of the village elders, Boaz announced that he would become the redeemer. He would buy the land and that Ruth would become his wife and he would care for Naomi and Ruth. So Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. Then he went to her. The Lord enabled her to conceive. She gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. From hopeless, penniless, and alone to cared for and blessed, Naomi sat with her grandson in her lap, thanking God for his blessings. Ruth's son was named Obed, and he would grow up to one day care for the family that brought him into the world, including Naomi, his grandmother. Boaz redeemed the family inheritance. Now Obed would continue the family line, protect the inheritance, 
and provide for his family. A baby was born in Bethlehem that changed Naomi's life and gave hope for the future. All her hurt and pain, everything that had been broken and destroyed, everything she'd gone through had been redeemed.
Everything broken in your life, he can restore. Every hurt and pain, unfulfilled dream can be redeemed. Now, ready for the surprise ending of the story? The women living there said, Naomi has a son. They named him Obed. Here's the cool part. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. Obed's son, Jesse, had eight sons. The youngest was named David, who became king of Israel. Naomi, the woman who ran from God's land and God's plan, was the great-great-grandmother of the king. But wait, there's more. 27 generations later, another baby was born in Bethlehem. Jesus. And Jesus was a direct descendant of Boaz and Ruth and Naomi. He came to change lives. He came to bring hope. He came to redeem. When you started this, we started the story, you probably didn't see that coming. Naomi was fully, completely restored, and she was part of God's plan to one day send his son as a redeemer. Imagine God in heaven deciding who, who should be in the, the lineage of my son when he comes. And he chooses someone who made a horrible mistake and a tragic failure. Naomi, what a beautiful picture. And what an encouraging story. See, you may think, after what I've done, there's no way God can use me. After my mess ups, after my past, after my history, after the mistakes I've made repeatedly, there is no way. The life lesson from Naomi is, regardless of what you've done or how far you've run, God still has a plan for your life. God can and will use you to change the world. Would you bow your heads with me? And I want to pray for you today. If you say, Pastor Rod, I am haunted by my mistakes. I'm haunted by the mistakes of my past. I've, I've messed up, and I know it. And I want to believe that God has a plan for me. And this story gives me hope that maybe, just maybe, he does. Would you pray for me? Would you pray that God will use me in spite of my past, in spite of my failures? It may not be anything you did. It may be something that was done to you, but you've been defined by the pain of your past. Listen to me. Jesus wants to redeem the pain of your past and use it and use you for his glory. I want to pray for you. If that's you and you're in this room, would you just raise your hand? I'm going to pray for you right where you're at today. Yeah. If you're watching online, you can uh, type in the text box or you can press the button for prayer. We're going to pray. If you raise your hand, would you do one more thing? Would you just stand? Because we're going to pray for you together. I, I shared with you earlier, uh, there will be people who will walk with you on the journey. Please don't be embarrassed to stand because we're going to pray with you. Someone's standing near you. Would you go stand with them? Put your hand on their shoulder or put your arm around them. And we're going to pray right now that the Redeemer, who's faithful and true, will minister to you. And he'll make a way where there has seemed to be no way. Lord, thank you. Thank you that your inclination toward our failure is not to forever punish us. Thank you that you don't put us on the shelf and decide it's over. There's no way. He's, he's marked. She's marked. But instead, Lord, you, you beautifully illustrated to us in this story that no, no matter where we've gone, no matter what we've done, no matter what been, has been done to us, that you still have a plan to redeem that 
and to use us. Lord, I pray for those who are standing today. I pray for those watching online that you would redeem the mistakes of the past, that you would redeem the hurts of the past. Lord, that right now you would give them hope and, and let them see that you still have a plan and you still have a purpose for their life. God, I pray that as they walk this journey of hope with you, that, that they would have a sense that you are directing them again. Lord, we can't change what happened before, but we can absolutely affect what we do right now. And so we choose to just follow you towards the future you have for us. Lord, I pray for people who the hurt is long ago and it's framed their life for way too long. Lord, would you allow them to see that you have a place, that you have a purpose, that you have a plan, that you are making a way. Lord, I pray for people who the hurt is fresh, who the mistake is fresh. I pray, Lord, that you would help them even as they're processing through that and through the, through the hurt and the pain and the guilt and the shame, you would help them to see, Lord, that failure is not final. They are not finished, but you still have a plan. And so, Lord, we choose to walk with you and follow your plan. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you make a way for us when there is no way. We worship the God who has a plan for us in Jesus' name.